thousand times a day to mean hello, goodbye, how are you, good morning, good night. But shalom means so much more than just that. It's a deep word. It's a thick word. It is a rich word of God's people. You see, a lot of times the word shalom is translated into your tongue to mean peace. And that's not bad. But because it is such a heavy word, a thick word, a rich word, it means so much more. It takes a lot of your words for this one word, shalom. If I were to try to explain it, it means something like, I wish for you the fullness of everything God desires for you. Wow. <clears throat> That's a lot. Amen. When you say amen, which also comes out of the Hebrew, it means I agree with that. Shalom means a lot. It means that God desires for you health this day, peace this day, wholeness this day, holiness this day, purpose, commitment. I wish for you this day, my friends, the fullness of all that God desires for you. And so, shalom. I trust that uh, you were given a gift of God last night of a long and peaceful sleep. Although I realize the temptation of meeting so many new faces who come from so many different towns that some of you might have given in to the temptation to stay up late getting to know one another. Some of your smiles are very revealing. <laughs> but I also know that some of you did not get a peaceful night's rest last night because you are here this weekend, some of you wrestling with a call from God. And I know from my experience that God does some of his most effective work in the middle of the night. God has been a disturber of dreams for thousands of years. And some of you were up last night asking some very long, deep, and thick questions as well. It is so hard to explain to someone else how God speaks to us. Some of you are struggling with that right now. I know because I've tried. It's hard to explain to people when they ask questions like, well, how do you know that God is talking to you? How do you know that it's not just your imagination? How do you know that it's not just delusions of grandeur? Or some people might even get offended that you might even hint or assume that God would speak to you. They might say things like, don't you think it's arrogant to assume that the God who created all of the universe might take time out of his busy day to talk to someone like you? But you know what's behind that question? What's behind that question is them saying, I'm offended because how can you say that God would speak to you when God is not speaking to me? Why is God not speaking to me? Some of you may have already heard that question. And if you haven't, if you pursue this talking of God in your life, you might hear that question in the future. But I'll put you at rest because I'm going to give you the answer to that question. When someone comes up to you and demands to know why God is talking to you and not to them, I want you to say this. You say, God is talking to you. And God wants to know why you are not listening. And here I am rambling on. I haven't even, I haven't even introduced myself to you. My name is Jeremiah. I am the son of Hilkiah, a priest in the land of Benjamin. I grew up in the town of Anatoth. Uh, anyone ever been to Anatoth? Anyone? No. Well, from the giggle, I guess maybe I should ask anyone ever here of Anatoth? You're a Bible guy in the back. <laughs> Anatoth is a small town, and not many people have heard of it. Most people know it because I wrote the name down in my writings. 
but uh, it's a small town. I, when folks ask me where is Anatol, I usually say, well, it's not that far from Jerusalem. Uh, some of you are from small towns. You know how that goes. People ask you where you're from, and you say the name of the town. They say, well, what's that near? Where's the, who here is from a small town? Where are you from? Carlisle. See, I spoke with someone recently who was from Newville, and they said, oh, that's not far from Carlisle. <laughs> but I assume you would say, I'm from a town not far from Harrisburg. It's all relative. Anatom is not all that far from Jerusalem, and that's where I'm from. I'm also assuming from the looks, the quizzical looks on some of your faces, that I may not be what you were expecting from a visit from a prophet of ancient Israel. Yes? Good. Because that was deliberate. Many of you were assuming that I would march in front of you today wearing the long robes and the long beard. I have the sandals, though I must say your version are so much more comfortable than ours. I did not dress the way I am comfortable dressing and have decided today to dress the way you are comfortable <coughs> dressing. I hope I've done all right. I've done this so that I will not seem strange to you, that I will not seem so different from you, because I know how easy it is to assume that just because a story of God takes place a long, long time ago, that somehow we assume that people were different back then. God was different <coughs> back then. God doesn't necessarily work that way now. These ancient stories don't really have that much to do with us. Here. <clears throat> and now. You're not alone in this. I grew up as a boy in Anatot. I read my holy scriptures. I, I studied the Torah. I read stories of these great heroes of the faith, like Abram and, and Moses. And I remember thinking as a young boy, how strong these heroes of the faith seemed to me. How chiseled out of stone, how almost unreal, mythical they seemed. I mean, how would you or I do if God, who we had never seen, spoke in the middle of the night and said, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your home. I want you to leave it all. And I want you to follow me to a land that I will show you when we get there. I think that sounds like a shaky deal. You? And yet that is exactly what God asked Abram. Why would he ever say yes to something like that? We may not be in this room had he not said yes. Or I remember reading stories about Moses. Oh, Moses. And God called this Moses to, to stand up face to face, nose to nose to the king, the pharaoh of Egypt, and demand that Pharaoh let God's people go. To take his finger as if it was the divine finger of God and poke Pharaoh right in the chest and say, my children are not your property. You have sinned gravely in the eyes of God and you will let my people go. Oh. He had to be nervous, that Moses. I remember as a boy thinking, <laughs> I hope God never sends me to go poke a finger in the chest of a king. I don't know if I could stand it. I don't know if I could do it. And besides, God chose Moses to do this when he was 84 and a half years old. I was just a kid. I at least had a couple more decades to grow into this kind of thing. Or at least so I thought. I'm here to tell you, my friends, that God did call me the way he is calling many of you. And our stories are very similar of what I went through, of what you're going through, about the task that God had for me to do, the task that God has for each and every one of you to do. Some of you are sitting in this room because you are trying to figure out a yes or no question. And that question is, is God calling me? 
Well, I'm going to put you to rest because I'm going to answer that question too. Yes. God is calling every single one of us that breathe the air that God puts in our lungs. It's not a question. The question you are here to discern is not, am I being called? But what does God desire for me to do? How does God wish to use me? It's a different question. When I was just young, minding my own business, God spoke. And he said something along the lines of, Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, I knew you before you were ever born. Before you were even conceived, I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. I consecrate you. I choose you to speak my word to the people that need to hear it. You will be a prophet to all the nations. And I have to admit to you, my friends, that when I heard that, I panicked a little bit because that whole prophet to the nations is very different than prophet to the neighborhood. <laughs> Nation sounds like kings and, and queens and, and governors and, and, and generals and, and leaders. I don't know that I'm up to that. I, I don't know that I could be on that level. I, I don't know that I'm ready for this. I don't know that I'm qualified. And that's what I said to God. That's exactly what I said to God. I said, God, I said, I don't even know how to speak right. I don't know how to speak good. And besides, I'm just a kid. I'm just a youth. Who in the world, oh God, is going to listen to somebody like me? No king is going to listen to me. Can you, who is the youngest one here? Who is, who is 16 years old? Keep your hands up. 15. 14? 14. 14? 15. All right, if you're 15, stand up. Look at these people. What if God were to call you at lunchtime today and say, I want you to leave this place right now. I want you to travel to the capital city of your nation. I want you to bang on the door of your president. And I want you to demand to be seen. I want you to tell him that I have a message for President Barack Obama. And it is from God and you must let me in. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? Okay, now you know how I felt. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not up to that. My own brothers don't listen to me. My uncles don't listen to me. The people in the neighborhood don't listen to me. Why is King Josiah ever going to listen to someone like me? I'm not up to this. I'm not ready for this. God, you must be mistaken. <laughs> I think I made God mad when I said that. Because God took his divine finger and he poked it right in the middle of my chest. And if you've never had the divine finger poke you in the chest, try to avoid that, my friends. There's a good way to avoid that, and that's by being agreeable and obedient to God. It's very unpleasant to have the divine finger poking you in the chest. God was angry, and he said, how dare you? How dare you suggest that the creator of the universe has made a mistake by calling your name? It is you, Jeremiah, who has made the mistake to think that I, who created the world out of nothing, can't use someone like you. I created you. I put the air in your lungs. I put the treasure in your heart. And I don't ever, ever want to hear you say again, that I am only a youth. I have chosen you. I have appointed you to be my prophet to the nations. You will go everywhere that I send you. You will say whatever I have appointed you to say. And you will not be afraid of them. Because I will always be there to deliver you. And then God did something really strange. God reached down I 
man, the man of unclean lips. Those aren't my words. Those are words of the prophet Isaiah. When he was called by God in the temple, he said, Ah, I'm a man of unclean lips. I know what words have come out of this mouth. How can the words of God come out of this mouth? God reached down and he grabbed a burning coal out of the fire in the altar and he placed it on Jeremiah's lips. And in that burning, he purified Jeremiah. In the same way, he reached down and he touched my lips. He purified me. He put his words here. See, I was not the first person to hear a call from God and to decide that I'm not qualified for this. Moses, my great hero, the mythical strong man of faith, I went back into my Torah and I saw how many times he made God angry by insisting, I cannot do this. You've got the wrong God. He was actually more insistent about it than I was. And so many more. It has been said in your generation that God does not call the qualified people. But God qualifies those whom he has called. It is not my ability out of my own heart, out of my own stuff, to be able to do the work of God. It is my willingness to allow God to do his work through me. And that takes a trust and faith <coughs> that I'm still growing into to this day. I shared with you as I started that my story is not all that different from yours. That people really do not change that much in three or four thousand years. Things may look a little different. Things may move faster now. But the human heart has changed very little from my time to yours. God is calling you for just such a time as this. You may not feel qualified. You may not feel able. To which I say, welcome to the family. Because if God sends you on a work that you know that you can do, then you can do it. And who needs God? You are on an adventure, my friends. And I've got to tell you, it won't always be easy. If you read the words that I have left behind, I have never felt peace in this ministry. I have never felt peace in the calling that God sent me to because I was to put the divine finger in the chest of the king and demand that they repent, to put a rein around this runaway people called Israel and steer them back onto the path of righteousness, back into the covenant of God. And when you demand that people change, well, sometimes they'll get angry with you. But you will be doing God's work, and God will be there to deliver you. There's someone coming from the back of the room in a few minutes who has more to say on this, who's probably a little closer in touch with you in this day and this age than I, a prophet of ancient Israel. I want you to welcome him. I want you to hear what he has to say, but more importantly, what God is saying through him. And as I close, I'll be in prayer for each and every one of you. And my friends, I offer you shalom, shalom. shalom. which means peace. I wish for each and every one of you gathered here the fullness of all that God desires for you. Amen. Amen.